a chief kick a bitch in the ah! slap the whole nation story. All right. Uh, that one's from Hey, Would You Blow Me? Yeah, it's from Chief Kikovich. All right. Our final teenage hustle oh. is what this is called here. All right. So everybody sit back, mm. crack open a beer. I love these stories. Back when Charlie and I were on the verge of 19, food stamps used to be actual pieces of paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, $1, $5, and $10 denominations. <clears throat> They were distributed monthly to recipients. Until 1977, beneficiaries had to purchase them for a fraction of their face value, but they had to pay something. In 1977, the purchase requirement was changed, and we got an idea of how we could rake in a few bucks when the new law took effect. Our opinion was that most of the people on food stamps were losers, and that view has never been dispelled. (laughs) Wow. As soon as they started handing them out free of charge, the losers proliferated. You're not wrong. Mm -hmm. On top of that, the amount given per loser was increased. The idea was to haunt the parking lots behind the banks where they were given out, approach the scruffiest-looking basketball Americans (laughs) on their way to their cars. Nice. And offer to buy their excess food stamps for 20 cents on the dollar. I had to take a second for that one. (laughs) That is really fucking funny. Uh, We offered 25 cents on the dollar for $100 worth or more. They were happy to sell for cash, to spend on cigarettes, which back then we were going for 50 cents a pack, and malt liquor or something stronger. Some sold their entire allotment. We bought $8,000 worth that first month and sold them for 50% of face value to kids living in local college dorms. Mm. Charlie, Charlie would stay near his van and hold our working capital so I couldn't get robbed for more than $100 or so. He also held the food stamps I bought so my pockets wouldn't be bulging. At first, we weren't worried about getting popped for a federal crime. Even though it was illegal, the USDA didn't really care because we were not interfering with the purpose of the program. It was not to feed the poor. It was to prop up food prices. Kind of like uh, Joe Biden expanding food stamps, and now that's helped uh, the cost of food raise another, like, what, 14%? Yeah, it's, it's insane. Fuck Joe Biden. As long as the food was being sold to someone, didn't matter. That slowly started to change. We soon had it down so that we didn't have to hit the same bank twice to trawl for suppliers. We split up to cover twice as many distribution points. We bought in person at each place once, gave out our phone numbers, and told people who had food stamps to sell to call us. Mm. Losers, though, welfare people may be, they aren't completely stupid. Half of them started buying them for 15% of face value from other losers and selling $1,000 worth and more at the time. After the first month, we were peddling twenty grand wow! worth per month. But our inventory had grown to $70,000 because sales were slow. Mm. It was too inefficient to sell them off in small amounts at a time. So we started selling them in $250 blocks so the kids would be incentivized to pool their money. It still wasn't fast enough. Mm. We ran the numbers, dropped our price to 40%, and hired on-campus distributors at three local colleges and let them mark up to 50%. This is like a drug deal thing. I know, right? We started by selling them $500 face value at a time for a month to give our distributors time to build up some cash and then raise the minimum buy to $2,500. That's when the money started rolling in, and we had to work harder to find more suppliers in another city. As we became more practiced, we felt safe enough to not need a lookout to hold money, so we split up to cover more distribution centers. It was a constant struggle to balance supply and demand. It got so big that just before Christmas 1979, we shut the enterprise down. Mm. We realized that our greed was going to get us caught if we didn't stop. Yeah? Yeah? That month... We moved a total of $160,000. In 1979 money? That's a lot of cash. Yeah. Wow. Instead of making the rounds at the start of the following semester, we called it quits after two years. Including what we made on all of our previous hustles, we had sold more than enough for Charlie to set himself up with his own garage and me to finish my degree without the inconvenience of working. Nice. The risk was growing, profit (laughs) margins were being squeezed, and our worry was intensifying. Our suppliers started asking a higher price and soon stopped selling it to us altogether, signifying that others were starting to get in on the action. Mm -hmm. It was obvious that the market in trafficked food stamps was about to explode, making it impossible for the feds to overlook it much longer. The amount soon involved became impossible to ignore. 
We got out just in time to avoid undesirable government attention. In early March of 1981, we read in the Hartford Current Hmm. that more than 40 people had been swept up since early January in an ongoing series of arrests for food stamp fraud. Had we not gotten out when we did, we could have done time like the rest of them. I'm getting ahead of the story, so back to 1979. My final exams ended. We treated ourselves to a month in Hawaii. Nice. It was our first trip anywhere for more than a couple of days and the first time we had been any farther away than upstate New York. Our initial impulse was to take Arlene and Lynn, the two who were our first pickups in front of the Pan Am building, but that thought was fleeting. Taking Asian pussy to Hawaii was foolhardy on its face. Only thick-witted men would do it. (laughs) Asians, huh? Mm -hmm. Like that? Ooh. Yeah, there you go. That's trouble. On our first night there, Charlie found us a couple of beach bunnies. They lasted for two days before we had to move from the Hilton Hawaiian Village to the Outrigger because they were too clingy and knew where we were staying. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I've been to the Hilton Hawaiian Village. It's fun. <clears throat> At our new digs, we upgraded to a two-room suite, and Charlie snagged two dancers, Hukie and Momi, cousins who worked the Luau Hula shows. Mm. I have never had a basket fuck. But <laughs> I can't imagine that it could possibly be better than doing a Polynesian hula dancer who knows how to rhythmically contract and relax her vaginal wall muscles in sequence. Damn! And doing a hula while riding you, cowgirl. It was like Hukie's pussy was giving me an expert blowjob. <laughs> I gotta take a breath after that one. Wow. wow. We showed them a good time during the day as well as them well as letting them be our tour guides before work. We did end up spending a couple thousand on each of them over the month, but they saved us money by steering us away from the tourist trap clip joints and taking us to see the real Hawaii. We ate and drank at the places the locals ate and drank at and sampled the nightlife where Hawaiians partied. For example, the girls told us to avoid the expensive guided tour buses over Pali Highway and take public transport for a quarter to see some of the most beautiful scenery on Oahu. Mm. At each stop we got off at, they steered us away from the overpriced rip-off places to the good shops and the places off the beaten path that had better food. Taking them along and buying them lunch was cheaper and more fun than the tours, even after buying them new bathing suits, which were also fun. We, by which I mean Charlie, made friends wherever we went, and random people invited us to hang out. On Saturday, we hung around at a family barbecue, eating and drinking after we repaired Momi's mother's car. She bought the parts, and we supplied the labor. This is where Charlie's expertise paid off. He bought identical parts at a scrapyard from newer cars of the cheapest models that used those parts had been totaled. He had Momi there, who was crying how she didn't have much money, and scored a free master cylinder. Hmm. She rewarded the guy with a full-body hug and a kiss on the cheek. The guy asked her out, so she told him she was recovering from a painful breakup and it was too early for her to start dating again, but if he gave her his number, she would call when she was ready. Mm-hmm. Hey, there you go. That's one way to let him down easy. Yeah, yeah. When there was no other choice, he bought parts from the dealer. He asked for cheaper parts for other models that cost less. They were the same thing, but if you ask for some parts for a Falcon instead of a Lincoln Continental, you pay 60% less. Mm-hmm. We also gave it a tune-up, changed all the fluids, put in brakes, replaced the master cylinder, and flushed the radiator. Before we left, Charlie wrote out a list of all her car's parts and the less costly identical parts from another make, model, and year. Other relatives who asked were given similar lists for their beat-up transportation. That made friends and the atmosphere warmed noticeably by the time we were done. We spent the morning and most of the afternoon buying parts and working under that car. Charlie made the actual repairs while I assisted holding the lamp, helping remove or attach parts, etc., When we were done, I was as filthy as he was. While we showered, the women washed our clothes. We joined the extended family at the table wearing red plastic hula skirts and had our balls broken in a good-natured manner. (laughs) Nice. We didn't really notice because Momi and Hoki were sitting next to us giving us handies under the table. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Their families thought we were smiling because we could take a joke. (laughs) We could, but that wasn't the only reason for our good humor. Nice. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. That's a thug life that that's right there. <laughs> that is too damn funny. One random hangout involved a motorcycle trip up to Halikala Crater Saturday afternoon, so we rented motorcycles and camped out. We drank all night, watched the sun rise, and ate breakfast before heading back. Camping on Halikala was something we planned to do 
so we brought winter clothing and camping gear. We both knew how cold it gets up there. Hmm. We also bought Hukie and Momi new grass skirts and coconut bras in return for their used ones. We decorated our living room at home with them, along with 11 by 14 prints of photos we took of them, giving us a private hula show wearing them. Nice. When they dropped us at the airport, we gave them each an envelope with $750 in endorsed traveler's checks inside, along with a handwritten note thanking them for showing us around the real Hawaii and a suggestion that they could make bank as tour guides. We included our phone numbers so they could call us if they wanted to see us again the following year. Upon our return, we bought a three-bedroom suburban house outside of New Haven on a a one-and-a-half-acre lot and furnished it with antiques. We had $4,600 in food stamps left over, so we had one hell of a Memorial Day cookout for family and friends, including Pasquale and Maria Carmelina. The day before, we hit the A&P, ShopRite, Stop and Shop, and Pathmark on Frontage Road for their best steaks, including wet-aged tri-tips, the leanest hamburgers, and everything else expected at a summer cookout. You're making my fucking mouth water. That sounds good. Spending too much in food stamps at a time would have been suspicious, so we had to shop at all of them to get everything. Mm. They never asked for ID to prove you were on the program or enforced all the little rules they usually ignored, but a $500 purchase and meat all at once at 1980 prices would raise a red flag. Yes, it would. That first party only made a dent, so we had to repeat on July 4th, and we <clears throat> still hadn't depleted it by $1,000. Wow. We never thought about it before, but the experience of trying to spend that small sum caused us to get an idea of just how much food was purchased by college kids using our food stamps. Yeah, Mm -hmm. probably helped a lot of guys out. Back when $1,000 could actually feed you for a few months. One thing we learned from a cashier I met while shopping for the Labor Day feast is that at the time, a 30,000 square foot grocery store had a great week if they sold $100,000 worth of all merchandise combined, and we sold... Almost one and three quarter million dollars worth. Wow. It would have been, we would have been in so much trouble if we were arrested. And for the first time, it occurred to us that federal prison would have been likely if we got caught and if they knew the scale of our operation. Neither of us ever did anything illegal or even questionable again. Mm -hmm. At the first party, my brother-in-law, who was a know-it-all in the best sense of the word, noticed the 37 rugs we had on all the floors in the house except the kitchen. He said he thought they were Persian rugs, and most of them proved to be so. I took them off the floors of the dining clubs at Yale when we cleaned them out and found some when we were collecting furniture off the streets. Those are worth a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Christie sold them all at auction or in private sales within the month. At our July 4th party, we handed Ed his cut. His wife, Carla, was thrilled. She'd been trying to make the numbers behave so that they could buy a new plumber's truck and hire another plumber. They had been about to ask Charlie if he could help them by fixing a beat-up piece of crap truck, and now, instead, they could buy a new one. Nice. Charlie had finished his vocational school training, so he took a job with one of Pasquale's old friends from Sicily by the name of Annabali, who was looking for someone to sell his shop to in a few years. I still had two semesters to go. I took the RN licensing exam and started my 40-year career. Mm. A week before the following Christmas, we went back for six weeks in Hawaii to party with Hukie and Mommy, but that's a story for another day. If I decide to tell it at all, and if anyone has any interest. Anabali was one hell of a mechanic, an honest, wonderful mentor for a guy like Charlie. While I slaved away working the bloodiest shifts at a nearby ER treating the survivors of weekend situations the Puerto Ricans and blacks managed to blunder their way into, Charlie spent those years practicing what he learned and adding to his knowledge. Anabali operated a two-bay garage, big enough to make a good living, but small enough to be able to have a life. He wanted to pass the business on to a young man, but his sons had other ambitions. Charlie bought him out in 1987, but kept his ownership a secret from Madonna by having it registered with a shell company in the Cayman Islands. Nice! (laughs) Dude, you guys are fucking geniuses. God damn, that's awesome. Fuck, that's awesome. (laughs) He bought my interest in the house shortly after and transferred it to the same shell company. He married Adana, I moved out, and he paid rent to the titled owner. He never trusted Adana, so he never let her know how much he was worth and only married her for his son's sake. He okay. never should have, but I think that even though neither of us was really Catholic at heart, we were somewhat programmed by it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll share more about that train wreck of a marriage later, now that I've been reading Charlie's deepest thoughts and feelings about it. Mm. Charlie and I continued to hustle with moderate success and a couple of failures. 
Shortly after he knocked up Adana back in 1982, Charlie and I got some 900 numbers and set up a phone sex boiler room in 83 nice! just before that fad started to take off. <laughs> That would be a story for another time if I think it might be of interest after I finish writing it. Dude! Dude! You that, have to write that! Dude! What are you talking about? <laughs> These phone, stories are awesome! A 900 number phone sex hustle? You can't bait the hook and not let us bite. Uh, you know what I did, though? To, <laughs> the, wow. this, when I was a kid, uh, this one dude's father I knew was just a raging fucking dick. Oh, yeah? So, uh... I went over there to, you know, because I to, was house-sitting or checking on the house. House-sitting. Well, I went in there, dialed. Oh, <laughs> no. 1-900-wet-tits. No. <laughs> Look it off the hook. You left it off the hook. <laughs> you fucking asshole. <laughs> what? <laughs> My buddy got blamed. <laughs> That is so fucked up. It was like dollars <laughs> What? It was in godly. I could hear him. It's like, I don't know. I paid $3,000. His wife is like, what do you, who is, who is calling those? It wasn't me. <laughs> You're such a dick. Oh, God, it was funny. <laughs> that is funny, but you're such a dick. I know, I know. I know. You got me. Oh, you're lucky you didn't get your ass kicked for that one. <laughs> oh, and you know, you know how the the phone company used to have those phones that you could plug, you could just clip on the wires. And then yeah, yeah, them. of course. Well, I, I had one of those, and I would go behind people's houses and call nine one one. Oh, like I want to report a shooting. I just killed my wife. You're such yeah. a dick. And I'd run. I'd scurry <laughs> off. And, oh, oh, everybody shows up at the. <laughs> but you really yeah. had to fucking piss me off to make me do that to you. Watch Gruntspeak Live every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And if you want to join Pop for Supporters Sundays, go to redonkulous.com slash donate and make a monthly pledge. A link is in the Meat Gazer box.